Dave here. How are you? Today is the 10th of September 2023. In a bit close, a bit scary, not to worry. Uh, I've just been mucking around with the cameras to get an idea about how close in I can get. And uh, we'll switch around to a normal camera now. How's that? That's a bit better. And you can see the chat on the side there as well. I'll do a quick hi. I'm Carl, John, Derek, Rod, John K, Wayne, uh, John Para, Wally, Mike, Eric, Mark, Rod, Carl. Again, everything's good. That's great. Now, today on the show, I've got a fair bit to do. I'm going to try and punch it in as hard as I can. And uh, I'm going to give you some tips as well. Now, one of the tips that I'm going to show you is actually how to prepare a super cheap brush. This brush only cost me about a buck. I'll do it right now, as a matter of fact. How you prepare a brush to be a good brush. Now, this is a rubbish brush. This is a brass wire brush. And all we're going to do is we're going to tease the end of it. Because ideally, or ordinarily, I should say, the bristles in this are nylon or a synthetic. And they don't carry the paint or the finish as well as a brush that's got a natural hair in it. So all you do is you just hold the brush down and you give it to it with a brush. Don't use a steel brush because the steel will get in there. And if you're using a water-based product, you'll get rust marks pop up everywhere on what you're doing. This is also how I clean my brushes. I flip it over the other side, keep going. And you do that for about three or four minutes and you'll feel all the fibers end up with split ends. You know how so the women go on about, oh, I've got all the split ends. I'll have to get a trim to tidy it up. Well, we like split ends on paintbrushes. So there's a video all on its own and you will be amazed. <laughs> I'm telling you, you'll be amazed. Look, I'll show you how amazed you'll be. Let me see. You'll be this amazed. Look at it. You can see it already against that light, how they've been a little bit distressed. And it works brilliantly. And I'm going to show you on the job today how it goes. You will have all seen, I'll put this over here, out of the way. You probably would have seen on the title page there, on the title picture, that the, um, the box is coming along well. That's one of the things we're going to do is we're going to hit it with hard wax oil. Now, I've got two different types here, same manufacturer. One is a gloss and one is a satin. This is the satin, this is the gloss. I'm tempted to use the satin uh, hard wax oil because if something's glossy, it's just that little bit kind of plastic looking. I like, I like to have something look a little bit natural. Now this Akume just pops with this stuff. You wait till I do it. Now the thing is, I'm not gonna do it straight off. The next thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to show you over on the bandsaw. We'll do that right now, as a matter of fact. I'm going to show you how I relieve the project from the plug. So this was the male plug that's been cut off from there on the bandsaw. So I'm going to, I made another one up and I'll explain why I made another one up as well. So let's go over there and get this done. It's not focusing very well at the moment. Give me, give me a second. I will have a look as to why it's not focusing very well. I think that might have fixed it. Uh, no, it's not focusing again. I don't know why. Give me a second. I'm over here mucking around. I'm trying to get it to focus in on me. I think it'll work when I get in the picture. We'll see what happens. Oh, it's looking a whole lot better now. So we'll transition over there. Uh, having a quick read down the side here. Uh, when painting with these brushes, the hair seems coming out while painting. I've used a wire brush to clean my brushes for decades. Some of my older brushes just work better. I never thought wire brushes make. Yep, it works, it works, it works. Now I need some um, goggles and ear protection. Let, let's get this part done. It should come up better now that I'm in the picture, of course. <laughs> uh, this is the 
the piece that I've got. This is the female section. This is the male section. Uh, I managed to get the male section to penetrate a little bit better than I did on the main job because I changed the settings a little bit. I set this to four millimeter start depth and two millimeters flat finish. And I think I should possibly just do a dedicated video on how to do that rather than just incorporate it in a live stream. So I have this space there that's just over two millimeters deep, which is the male section sitting proud uh, of, the, of the blank, but the penetration is four millimeters in there and that will work well. Uh, so I've left that space so there's enough room for my bandsaw blade to travel in there. In nice and close, you can see it. All right, I have my resaw blade on here. It's probably not the best blade for this. It's very aggressive. So I'm going to use my push blocks and move it across, making sure that I've got this up high enough. I don't want to actually cut the surface of the female section. If I cut a little bit of the, this part of the body, not in the gap, if I cut a bit of this part off, that's fine because I'll plane the rest of it off anyway. So that's what I've got. It will push through there nicely. I better connect the power and the dust extractor to it. Uh, where are we? Grab that one. I did have it hooked up to my smaller bandsaw thinking that it might be an idea to run with that one on the show but the blank is just that little bit too tall and I couldn't get it underneath the uh, I couldn't couldn't get it underneath here on the smaller bandsaw so this has a capacity of 13 inches high which is high lift that's one of the reasons why I bought this one you remember I sold the Powermatic and I bought this and it was one of the best things I ever did this is a beautiful saw. All right, so I have everything here. I'm going to hold it with this and push it through. And then I'm also going to have this one ready in case I need a second one to just push it at the end and I can hold and pull at the same time. Bandsaws, don't wear gloves. Please don't wear gloves when you're using a bandsaw. If it catches a glove, it will pull you in. This particular one, I'm not talking about the bandsaws that the guys in Meatworks use because they have specialized bandsaws with a specialized glove that will stop the blade turning. This is not. This is only a carpenter's woodworking handsaw. Uh, I think I've waffled on enough. I need to say, stop tension me, all right. Done. That's my little protector here looking after me. I love it. Checking. Good tension. Pull this back away from the blade, release the emergency stop, turn it on. So I'm just going to take it easy. I'm not going to rush it. I'm pushing through slowly. Making sure I've got equal tension. Now she's just about done. So now I've got to hold it here and I'm going to hold it at the back there and pull. The whole thing is about staying safe. That's done. I'm going to turn her off and wait. Remember, no rush. No rush. This has got a brake on it that stopped. There you go. So this is inlay within inlay. I'll come over here. Back to this one. There you go. I should have really pulled the goggles down, but I didn't. The rest of that will, will finish in a minute. Anyway, that is very much like that that I had done. I'll just turn this thing off down. No, it's, it's all right. It's gone. There was something else just jumped up in the way. So I would now get my hand plane and plane this down so it's nearly flush and then I get the sander and just go over the top with the sander with starting with maybe 80 grit 
and then work through all my grits. And this one I took down to 2000. So now we are ready to do the pop section. <laughs> this is the part I love. I absolutely love it. So you're probably curious to see how it looks in the flesh. Let's bring it around. So there it is. Remember this a couple of weeks back, or a few weeks back, this was simply a drawing that I did, I don't know, on a piece of stick or something lying around. Now, it's the beginning of a really beautiful toolbox. This is a project I've encouraged a lot of people to join along with me. There's two people have decided to, so I think it's Nathan and also um, uh, Peter. So I'm keen for other people. You can watch the whole series. What I've done is with all the videos on this particular project, at the end of each video, there's a link to the next one. So I think it's going to be around 11 or 12 episodes, if you can keep your eyes open that long. But it will give you so much detail on how to do it all the way through, starting from the concept and the idea. And we're going to do a bit more concept this afternoon or later on today as well. Good morning, Cole. Now, Cole is chuffed. He gave me a call yesterday. He said, Dave, guess what? I've hit 1,000 subscribers. So that is fantastic. That's for Gifkin's Dovetail. I did put a link at the beginning of this chat session for Cole's page and for the show that he did today. Now, you may also remember that I built this so that I could remove this. This is a timber hinge that I've made. And we're going to take it off the box on purpose going to take the door off the box by pulling the dowel out which is the, the pin there you go that's the pin for the hinge just six millimeter dowel and I'll take this off here there it is so that part there is going to pop <laughs> so we're gonna we'll do that first um, I'm gonna move this down out of the way I probably will Look, I'm, I'm, while I've got the product out and I'm using the hard wax oil, I may do the whole box as well. Maybe not the inside, but we'll see. Uh, let me see, how am I going to do this? I think I need a couple of painter's pyramids. I should have got those out. Now, painter's pyramids are to elevate whatever you're working on. One, two, three... Four, five, six, seven, eight. That'll do me. These things keep whatever you're working on off the ground or off. They've got a pointy thing on the end, and that's self explanatory. They've got pointy things. Um, the box, the main part of the box, I'll put oil on and then I'm going to rest it on its back. But the door, which we, we're going to do first, because that's going to be the exciting part. I will do the back first, and then I'll tip it over, and then I'll work on this side. Now, I will go to the overhead camera for Carl Cam, and uh, have some fun. Oh, before I start, this is a, just a piece. This is one foot by one foot, 300 by 300 microfiber cloth. I buy these. And you can get them anywhere, like I got those particular ones from Aldi. I'm looking for some scissors. David, where are the scissors? Uh, again, something I should have got out prior, but I think I've got some down here. Give me a sec. Yes, I do. Now, whether they're sharp or not, I've no idea. I did do a video on sharpening these things but I, I cut it into quarters. Now, one thing you'll notice with microfiber cloth is that it's always hemmed around the edge. Now, that's because if they didn't, it would fray really easily, and we don't want that because the bits of frayed microfiber cloth get into the... Uh, I was just thinking about that commercial for McLean's uh, toothpaste when I was a kid. Mrs. Marsh, it gets in. Oh, yes, just like ink gets into this chalk. <laughs> Who remembers that ad? 
That was a long time ago. Now, once I've got, once I've cut them, I've got to get rid of all of these bits of fluff that have just been released by cutting. Okay, now that should hold on quite well. So these are going to be what's called a mop. So when a French polisher does French polishing, they use a mop. And it's basically a rag that they bunch up like this to look like a mop. And then that's what they use to hold the product and also polish at the same time. Now we're, going to, we're not going to do French polishing. It's going to be similar. I'll use a similar process. Just cleaning all these while I've got the time. Well, one of the other things I'll do to make sure that this is going to be okay and we don't have any rubbish embedded in there and start coming up into the finish, I do this. Vacuum it. All the way over, both sides while we've got it there. See, there's a couple of pieces of stuff that were already embedded and that would have been ugly. Oh, I better take the screws out as well. Remember we put screws in for the magnetic catches. If I've got a Phillips head screwdriver here, I do. So we'll take those out. I'll do a quick reading. Everyone's telling Cole what a lovely person he is. <laughs> he gets embarrassed. Don't you, Cole? Colgate. It was Colgate, was it, Mrs. Marsh? <laughs> anyway, it was a long time ago. You'll have to forgive my old uh, brain. Okay. Akume, I don't know of any other timber that pops like this does. When I say pop, I mean, I mean it just goes these beautiful colors and it reveals the grain so well. Let's have a look at Carl Cam. Uh, let's see if I've got a close-up version. There we go. Okay, so there's the, the back of the door. And I did say I was going to use satin. And I will, it says to stir well, which I will do. I'll get a little uh, MDF stirring stick. Remember, I, I keep my long off cuts. But this, this stuff, it's only three mil thick MDF. I keep them for stirring sticks. I just dock them off on the uh, capex. Or drop saw, you don't have to have a capex. Whatever you want, whatever saw you've got. Okay, <clears throat> stir it up. Now they say to do a thin coat. I'm getting right into the corners here at the bottom. What? What is going on with this stupid computer over here? I have, don't you just love it? when software throws up messages to you as if you don't know what's going on. Oh. And it, it interrupts whatever you're doing. I find it very annoying. Annoying sometimes enough for me to consider getting rid of the software. Here we go. Now you're not seeing much at the moment, but it does darken up as as it stays there. Does that make sense what it just said? Mm. See how this piece here and there, see the comparison? It darkens up depending on the laminate. See, this is a whole series of different laminations. So I brush it on to start. And then I'm going to use the mop to tidy it up. Now, this side might be a little bit boring, but the other side that's got the two different types of timbers is not, will not be boring at all. And also, when I do the end grain, 
that will also be very nice. Now I do full strokes. Oh, the thing with the wire brush, the, uh, the brass brush, it does pull the, fibre, the loose fibers out as well, right at the beginning. Okay. There we go. Now that's looking a bit different to that side, isn't it? Now I'll do all of these bits within the hinge. And when I do the end grain, that looks that also comes up really nicely. Now the weather is starting to get a little bit warmer in Australia, uh, so we're only just in the spring. So people uh, who work on the uh, winter, oh sorry, the spring equinox as being the beginning of spring, where ha we had a 29, actually it was 32 degrees the other day when uh, Vicky and I were coming back from the markets. And later in the week we're expecting 34 degrees. Now that's Celsius, so that's a little warmer than um, Fahren uh, Fahrenheit. Now, I'm just trying to work out the best way of doing it. I think I will put some pyramids down now. And put that on top. Move a couple of things out of the way. Now, one of the things that I did mention is that the penetration was very, very shallow. Remember when I measured this on the CNC and I said, well, it's only one and a half millimeters, maybe two millimeters narrower at the top than the opening in the hole in the female section of the door here. Now, remember, that's a 60 degree cutter, not a 45 degree. If it was a 45 degree, well, then every millimeter across would give me one millimeter penetration. With every millimeter across on the 60 degree cutter, it gave me a little bit more penetration. So it wasn't enough. And there are some spots here, this one in particular, that I can feel this is still, still moving a little bit. Now I'm hoping that when I put the hard wax oil on, it will soak down in underneath that and make it so that it uh, sets it there. If not, I will just um, put it on the machine and on the CNC and take it all out. Here we go. This side is going to look so much nicer because of the contrasts. And as I said, you won't see it right at the beginning. And I haven't used the, the mop yet to clean it, clean it all off. And end grain is the real punchy part. The, the way the light is sitting on it at the moment, I'm just having a quick look up at the screen there. It's not showing how it really looks. When I've, when I've done this part, I will get the, uh, I'll get the other camera and bring it in so you can see it better and see the end grain. And then we'll move on to the other part. There's a couple of spots that I've got some rough work with the hand plane. I was a little bit impatient. That's going well. And I paid the penalty. It's the, what I did to the brush right at the beginning has just made this a high quality brush. Remember, right the way through. Mmm, 
I'll get the other camera and bring it around for the end grain. Got the poor dog on the floor. He didn't know what was going on. Ha! Sorry, Pierre. It's okay, mate. Go back to sleep. Okay, we'll do a viewer's project in a minute as well. Uh, let's go to this camera. Bring it in closer. All right, let's get the end grain done. See the difference straight away. Lovely. And I'm going to put a bit more on on the top here to get it to soak into those areas that I wanted it to. And then we'll start mopping. nice. Okay. First little bit, I'll just give it a dunk and that should be okay. And then gloves. I need gloves for this part. Just the one will do. Hard wax oil is a pain if you get it on your hands. That's much nicer with a mop. And that's all good. We'll do it across the top here. And I haven't done the other end. And mop it again. All right, let's see if I can show you how it's coming up. We're getting a whole lot of reflection at the moment, which is not great. But in at the end, the color is a whole lot nicer. Let's flick that over there and then I'm going to move this after I go to the other camera. Uh, where are we? Okay. Now, it might seem like a bit of an anticlimax right at the moment, but give it, give it an hour or so. And even tomorrow morning, that'll look a fair bit different. So while I've got it there, I'll, and while I've got the uh, hard wax oil out, I will move this down just very slowly on the pyramids. Good, there's a bit more. There. As you move it around, you'll see heavier deposits. It's the great thing about the mop. Oh, that's so nice. That really is nice. I'm, 
I'm trying to get into a position where you can appreciate what I'm seeing. Your, the cameras aren't picking up the detail. They, they're, um, there's a lot of glare happening from around and about, and it's just a little annoying. All right, let's, let's work on this one. I'm not going to do the back. I'm going to do the ends and the purple heart section. And And I think you'll see the difference there. Okay, up a little higher. Again, I'm going to muck around with the camera. And I want to try and get it in close on that corner so you can watch it. Okay, idle hands. Did you 30, 3D print your pyramids? No, I didn't. I didn't. Um, you missed a spot. I, good, thank you. Okay. Here we go. I'm going to do this corner. So hopefully the end grain will pop. All right, we'll just leave that sit for a second because I have to undo the screws that are holding the, the magnets in. Actually, no, I'll leave them. I'll leave them in. I'll leave them in. Doesn't worry me. Uh, so that we'll do this top right the way along. Oh, there's some figured grain coming up. Lovely. I'll show you that in a sec. So nice. It's such a nice, such a nice part of doing of the job. Is putting the finish on. Now remember, this is first coat, so second coat looks even better. Spin her around a bit. And we've got the purple heart down here. I wonder how that's going to look when I do hit that. That's not too bad. Derek had said to me I couldn't wait if it was if it was him. He couldn't have waited the week to do this. He'd have to do it. Um, and I nearly, I nearly <laughs> did put the first coat on because I was getting very excited about how it was going to look. It's 
See, now that I've started this part, I really do have to finish it. So I can't, I can't stop. Just making sure that we're not getting any runs. This part's not as important with the mop. <clears throat> I have to do inside on the bottom. Because one of the things we're doing is we're sealing it. The next thing I'm going to do on the show is, as I say, show a couple of viewers' projects, and then we're going to, I think, look at design for this top section. Now, the top section of this, the tills of this box, I'm going to create a design that actually uh, is a second toolbox. And that's something that I think is going to be a little bit unique about this. It's going to be like Thunderbirds. You know, Thunderbird 1 is, or Thunderbird 2 is, carries a pod, cut Thunderbird 4 maybe. Do you tell me which Thunderbird it is from that TV show that used to be on years and years and years ago? I'm showing my age again. So we're nearly, nearly done. Uh, I've got to do the top inside. I'll do that by spinning this up this way. We'll do this section here. Start at the top, I find it easier, and then it just runs down. Inside, I'm not going to mop. It's not as crucial. Okay, so it's both ends done inside. And now I'm going to tip it on its back. And go to another camera. Like so. You can see it darkening up already. Oh. I'll wait till I've done it. The nice part that's going to happen very soon, I'll hang it over the edge, is the splines that we put in. So all of these different parts of the project reveal themselves as you're going along when you're painting. Let's get this part done here. Shut that. I have to go back to this camera. Drop that to there. Come in over there and there. So these are the splines here that I was talking about. Let's see how they go when I come across the end here, and also across the dovetail end grain. There we go. They're not popping as much as I thought they would, but that's okay. Maybe I should have made the splines out of purple heart. That would have been interesting. But you can see the different, different colour. <laughs> Although it's not as dramatic as I had thought it would be.
you can see a little bit more from up there. Um, spin this around. So it's hanging off the edge so I can do this end and then I'll do some mopping. What do you reckon, Pierre? All right. It's very enjoyable. At the moment, it almost looks like Tassie Oak. But the gloss disappears off it and goes to satin. Oh, dropped it. The rotten thing has gone on the dust too. That's annoying. Okay. Both ends. And stand her up. bit there. Now I this might be obvious to a lot of people but I get down and I look across the finish and try and pick up a reflection from something and see if it's consistent. So I'm, I'm looking across the surface and doing this kind of bounce and if I see it's all the same that's good I've got a little spot there that was just a little bit different. And then you can just use your mop to quickly touch it up and make it look super special. All right, now I'm going to put the, uh, that camera on again and we'll go to take it off there. <laughs> I can move it around now freely. Okay, so down along the front here, you can see the grain here. This is an interesting grain pattern and they all look better once, see the figure there, you would, you would never see that. If I hadn't taken the head off the camera, to do this part and then we got the purple heart that's a little bit of glue I think that's a spot I need to touch up yep that's fine under there to make sure that we've got it all. Put that back over there. And then up on the top here, we've got some nice figure as well. Again, the, the lights are reflecting and you're not seeing it properly. And then down on the actual top, the lights again are reflecting big time. So down, this here was where I was wanting the hard wax oil to soak in underneath to kind of set it in. 
But that's, it looks pretty ordinary when <laughs> whilst it's drying. But we'll have a look at how it looks next week. I'll turn this off, come up to the other camera. Hmm. Anyway, I'll pop that there. And it does look a lot different to when I first started putting the finish on. You can see it just there to there where I haven't got the finish on the side here. I'll touch up this back after the show, possibly during the patrons meeting. All right, where are we? What's this? As opposed to spectrum in green from Captain Scarlet. Okay, look at the lid now. Uh, Wally, thanks guys. Going to Google it. To what the heck? The Fab Man's. I'm fabulous. It's shortening. F A B. Fabulous. I think. I think that's what it means. Now I've got to try and move these so I can uh, get things happening as far as the viewers' projects are concerned. Move this over a little bit further. Done. And this one, I think I can move over to that side out of the way and turn it sideways. I've got this uh, a little bit of stuff on the bench here. Um, like so and that'll give me a bit of space because I want to do something else I'll show you the viewers projects first and then I want to show you how we're going to design this top box that's going to go into here the sliding till and I've got some interesting ideas to work with with it but let's have a look here um, first of all we're going to have a look at Mark Palmer's now Mark has said, hi Dave, as per the YouTube comment, I'll, I'm making a raised bed with storage underneath. It'll have a bookshelf and a little cubby area for my son to use. I'm reusing two old beds that were both Tassie oak. I'm painting it white, my son's request, with some pieces left as oak. The timber has a few holes uh, from previous journey, so I'm filling and sanding them ready for painting. Now, so that's not... It, that's right down the end on the bed head. Let's see if I've got a better picture of that. Well, that's probably this one. So he's put some filler in there. Now he says, uh, the holes in the rails are for dowels to space the bed slats. Let's have a look at that. Um, this one. So you can see a couple of the bed slats there. And what have we got next? A larger version from further away so you can see it's kind of really tall and there you go there's the holes that he's been filling uh, down on the left hand side Tazio so that's stuff that was just going to get thrown away and he's made a large bed for his son to enjoy underneath so I think that's pretty cool so if you've got a project that doesn't matter what you're doing with like Mark is repurposing a couple of old beds to make a new one do it now then, Wally has also sent some stuff. Wally Bronson, who's watching at the moment, I think, Wally, your time for a bit of uh, sunlight on your particular area there. Hi, Dave. Here's a little bit of what I've been doing in my time. First installing waterproof flooring in our basement. Uh, and half bath in the basement. Let's see if I've got another picture there from you, Wally. That's, oh, that's pretty cool. Uh, now, the next, qu the next thing here. After the boss wanted a new storage cabinet, we purchased off-the-shelf oak front cabinets and a preformed countertop. Let's have a look at that. The cabinets are finished with three coats of water-based polyurethane finish. So Wally did all that himself. And last but not least... Uh, is our new 7.56 kilowatt solar system. There it is, up on his roof. Uh, it's been up and running for almost a month now. The panels are Panasonic 360 watts each. 
Total of 21 panels. No battery wall units yet, maybe next year. Uh, thanks, Dave. Keep up the great job with the videos, Wally. So that reminded me of, when I saw that picture, Wally, it reminded me of Mary Poppins and the chimney sweeps dance, bouncing around on the roofs. But maybe that was just me. <laughs> anyway, if you've got some projects that you're doing, doesn't matter what they are, oh, within reason, uh, and then send them in to me. Now, this is darkening up a lot. Now, see that? As I said, as it soaks in, it's very important that you mop it and let it dry. And then I'm going to give this a rub down with possibly some 800 grit paper to take all the fibers off. Now, what happens, no matter how well you sand a project, when you put a finish on, all of the fibers stand up and they act like little capillary hairs that pull moisture down into the timber here. So to keep it stable and to keep it nice to touch, after the first coat, you let it dry, maybe a day, give it a light sand, very, very light sand with some fine sandpaper. They recommend 150 or finer. I've taken this job down to 2000, because <laughs> that's just me. And uh, the, I will give it a, a finish off with possibly, I'll, I'll probably hit it with some five or 800 and then put the second coat on. I might even do that tomorrow afternoon. And then it's just about ready for me to move on to the next stage. Now, the next stage, I use something like this. I'll turn it over this way because it's going to be easier. And I mark it out to size exactly. Let's see if I can move this camera around a bit. There you go. I, I did, but I lost the chat off the side. Doesn't matter for the moment. So this is just a sheet of three millimeter MDF. Now I need to measure the width or the length of the, the toolbox and the depth and the height of the things that I want. And using my trusty Gifkin's jig pencil box, <laughs> that's there. And now I'm gonna measure the internal. So I have 862 millimeters. So I will measure 862. 862. And then put a square line across there. Give me a sec. <clears throat> I'll use the roofing square because this is basically something that I want to set out the tools on that I am wanting to use. So that's, that's the length. Next thing to do is the depth. So internal depth, I have 167. I'm gonna measure it at both ends just to make sure. 167. So I'll come up 167. And the other end. And a straight edge along there. It can be a piece of wood. It doesn't have to be a high quality straight edge like this one. It can be anything you want. We're just marking it up. But I have this, so I'll use it. Okay. So that is the area in this one. So all of this, forget this. And I'll do a little line down through here so I, I know where I'm at. All right. That makes life easy. Now, I'll come back to the other setup there so we can see some more chat. Now that I have that, I also have to work out the thickness of the timbers that I'm going to make the box out of. So that's my overall dimensions. Now I have been considering using some of the stuff from my great grandfather. Now I had some old drawers of his. This was actually uh, some timber from a, um, a glory box unit that he was making for my mother. Never quite finished it uh, when mum was probably in her early twenties and Arthur died while he was making it. So I'm 
the, the box itself, like the big unit, it, was, it had had it. It had been exposed to the weather. All the plywood in it, it was shot. But the drawers I pulled apart. Now this is cowrie pine. And it's maybe 10 millimeters thick, 3 eighths of an inch. I guess it would have been milled to in those days. And it's extremely stable. So I'm thinking about using that for part of it. And also the drawer fronts are silky oak which I think I showed everyone on the show last week. Now it has these handles in there already, but the problem is the handles go down very deep into the board, like they're, they're just milled into it. I don't know how I got that done. So I'm wondering whether I should incorporate this and have those as the two handles to pull the till out, make this the front to go in there. And then this would pull out. What are your thoughts? It already has a four millimeter rebate or dado, I should say, through there to support the plywood floor that was in it. But I don't know if I'm going to go with that or whether I should mill that out and put a new one in because it's kind of deformed along the bottom there. And I need it to be kind of straight. So they're my thoughts. And then I'm wondering whether I should rip this down the center on the bandsaw or just leave it at this thickness, maybe run it through the thickness planer. That may even be a better option for a lot of it. I'll, I'll measure the depth of that handle's re recess and then thickness plane this down because I don't want it that deep. I don't, yeah, that's just, I'm losing too much space having this, that's probably nearly just over, just under seven eighths of an inch. A bit more than three quarters, so it's probably around about 22 millimeters thick. A little bit heavy for what this is, like the whole box itself is only 18 thick. So 22 for a sliding drawer is, is possibly a bit big. These sizes are good. So with that information, I can now draw that onto this board. So looking at that, I can say if I take that down to 18, if, it'll, if I can get that low, yes, 22 at the moment. So if I take it down to 18, I'll be happy with that for the front. So I'm going to measure back 18. And 18 down the other end. I was just thinking, this might be boring, but it's all part of the process. And I'm sure if you're doing it for yourself, uh, you would spend this kind of time mucking around and trying to nut it out. Remember, this is live. So I'm in the process of design and just taking my time with it. So I've got 18 there. Now at the back, I will possibly use, I'll, I'll make the back 10 millimeters, no matter what I use, what type of timber I use, because the back's not gonna be as important. So I'll, I'll come back 10 millimeters. So the front was 167, so it means I'll come back 157 from the front. 157, and that will give me a 10 millimeter section there. 157. And then the ends, I think I'll also do 10 millimeters. How are we doing? Just on 12. That's all right. Ten millimeters thick on the ends, both ends, of course. Now, if this isn't terribly accurate, it doesn't matter. Again, because I'm just drawing it out to get a rough idea of what I can fit in here. This is where I start to look at the, what tools. I'll be putting in and how many layers and the surprise that I had I did mention that I you know a little bit of a surprise that I was going to do was this is going to be its own toolbox so I want to put things in here so it's upside down at the moment but you can get an idea so 10 millimeter ends 18 mil front 10 mil back now I might go to Carl camp for this next part Let's have a look. 
Mill the front to 18 inch. Yes. Um, it's not boring if you're learning something new. I th Wayne, that, that's an interesting point that um, Arthur would have been chuffed. Rather than just his stuff getting taken up to the tip. I can't tell you how many old pieces of wood furniture I see at the tip getting smashed by the machines up there. People don't seem to have any regard for the effort that went into making them. They call it brown furniture, I think, these days, you know. Well, there you go. Um, so I'm going to go to the Carl Cam. Uh, let me see, go to the HD one. There we go. So you can see all the layout there. I'll move this across a little. Now, I think it's important in a toolbox to have a few different things. I have here two block planes. This is a low angle block and this is a standard angle. So this is my Falcon, identical to my Turner 220. And this is a Ryder 69 and a half. Now I would like to have them in the top side by side, somewhere like that. See how they lay out? I don't want to have massive heavy things either end. These are quite weighty. So I would like to have them in the middle, possibly like that. And I would also like to have some chisels. So I have my little set of uh, Lubin chisels here. And you can see how it makes such a difference if you can lay things out. Now there's a space there and I don't really care because I can put something else in there. I could make a divider here. So I could have my chisels there, planes in the middle, and then I could have possibly this plane here at the end, like so. So I have my smaller planes up the top. I could have a sanding block there, or I could have a tape measure. I could have I think I've got a really, really nice square here. Where is it? I think I do. I've got, I've got that square and I've got this. What do you think would be good to put in the top layer of, of a woodworking... I'm, I'm looking around for other things to put in there. A woodworking toolbox. I have another square that I would really like to put in there. Give me a second. Um, here it is. I found it. Oh, and I found a couple of other things. <laughs> there it is. There it is. And not that one, but possibly this one. Here's a couple of other things I wouldn't mind having up on the top. Colin Clinton's square. That could look quite sexy up there. So I could have that out of the way. I could have this here. I could have this guy, which I don't want down in the main body of the toolbox to get damaged at all. I could have that there or I could have it sideways. Uh, the screwdriver is not going to fit. But if I took that fitting out, it would fit. I could have that over there. So you can see by drawing it out like this, however you want the, the layout, it's going to work for you. This part in the middle here, I'm thinking of creating a handle here. So I can pick this up and carry it around as my toolbox as well. So this might just be a single layer, or I might make it two layers. I'm not sure yet. If I make it two layers, well, then this area here, or this area here, one or the other, 
will be in its own little box that I can take out to get to stuff underneath and do the same here. Have this as its own box and take it out. So the next thing I want to do is find dead center of this. This is an interesting part. This is, I like it. So I can come from here back to this way now. Uh, 862 is 431 is center. Go across there with the square. So that's the middle. I will check it. I always like to check after I've measured 431, which will be 531 from there, which is pretty close. We're half a millimeter. Remember I was saying, don't panic about it. The length of the longest plane, is, that is 180. And this one with the handle is 180 as well. Okay, so half of 180 is 90. So we'll measure back 90. And then make it uh, 280 will work for me. Come back that way. Come across and across. So that should accommodate the hand planes in there nicely. Yes, beautiful. Now the handle, I think I'll probably go silky oak and it will be 18 as well. So I'm going to go down the middle of here, 18. So center of that is half of 138 is half of 140 is 70, so it'll be 69 will be center. Uh, 38, 69 is the center again. That's the middle. And let's say we're going to make it 18 millimeters thick is nine millimeters either side. Down to there, nine either side. And then this guy. Get him ahead in the way. As per normal. I used to do that. <laughs> I'd be lying under a car, working on a car late in the night with my father. Like I was only a little kid. And my job was to hold the light while I'd be doing stuff to the car. Hold that blinking light still. Turn it around the right way. Get your head out. Get your... Noggin out of the way, <laughs> say all this stuff to me. Uh, I think if I go 10 millimeters on these ones now, for the thickness of the timber, and 10, like so. And like so. So that's... This is the handle in the middle. This is the ends, and this is the compartment for each plane. There. Now I can see whether or not these things are going to fit in here or not. You know what, only perfect. This one, it'll fit. Just, but it will fit. I'm happy. Take that one almost up to the edge, and then this one to there. And I would make dividers in here as, as well in this particular tray. But the problem now is I need to make this a removable box or do I leave this one down low and that's the height and those items there stay there and I make a removable box for these ones over here. Now, if I make a removable box for these ones over here, Am I going to get all the chisels in side by side with a thing around the edge? No, I'm not. So what I can do is I can bring them across and have them looking a little bit like this and save on some space. So now I have enough room for another 10 millimeter or even six millimeter box here and a small box 
there for that guy to go in. And I think this, it's important that this one also possibly drops it in there or there. Anyway, that's... Let's go to the other camera. That's the kind of thing that I'm thinking of doing. Now, I hope that this kind of stuff inspires you. As I say on the front of my uh, lid there, be inspired. Do this kind of stuff. This is it's looking really, really nice. See how it darkens up? I told you at the beginning of the show that it darkens up really well. The Akume does darken up, but it does need time to soak in. And it's doing that. It's just, I, if I can spin this around a little bit, I don't know if there's any advantage to spinning it around, but <laughs> I thought it would be something nice to say. Um, let me have a think. So today I've gone through cutting the male plug off the female section on um, inlay and the issues that I had with that one that I didn't set it deep enough. I should have set it just roughly. I should have set the female to six millimeters deep. I should have set the start depth on the male to four millimeters deep and the flat depth to two millimeters deep. So if you can work with those ratios, it'll work very well for you. Again, whatever the female depth is total, your male start depth and flat depth have to be the same total. So if it was 10 millimeters deep for the female section, I would have possibly gone seven millimeters deep start depth and three millimeters flat depth. But if you're going to do that deep on your first pass for your, your start depth, you also need to do a clearance path in whatever software you're using for the CNC so that you take out that part before you hit your start depth. You follow? That's on, on outside the vector. Remember, it's got to be working on the outside of that, the vectors that you make for the text. All right. Uh, Steve, you enjoyed that? Yeah, that was my job when I was helping my granddad and he always smoked a cigar. <laughs> Thanks, Dave, for sharing your skills and thoughts once again. It's my pleasure. Okay, so I'm going to have the patrons meeting in a couple of minutes. So as I say at the end of each show, look after yourselves, be nice to each other, and I shall see you all next week. Bye.